Okay, so today we're going to finish up our discussion of uh, electric fields created by charge distributions, and we're going to learn about electric dipoles. Um, I plan on giving you afterwards there will be some activities for you to do that will that you'll have two days to complete. So let's just briefly remember what we did last class. We had uh, electric field created by a point charge is what we started with, and then using the extension that I can rewrite that equation for a point charge as dE equals 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught dQ over R squared. We set up a couple situations and we calculated the electric field. We used it to calculate the electric field for a long line of charge and we used it to calculate the electric field for a disk of charge. Now we, uh, for this one here, for the long line of charge, we originally calculated it for a short line of charge and they didn't, then I did an approximation to show how if x is really small compared to the length, or if the length of the line was really long, it, it reduced to this simplified equation, which is basically 1 over 2 pi epsilon naught lambda over x. And then we did a, a derivation for a, not a disk of charge, this is incorrect, we did it for a ring of charge. And I said disk of charge because that's the one we're going to do next. We're going to use this result for a ring of charge to do a derivation for uh, a disk of charge. So if I start here, you know, what if I have a disk of charge with radius capital R and charge capital Q? So, and we want to know what's the electric field that it creates uh, along an axis, you know, right here at a point, uh, a distance from the center of the disk. Well, let's start with our result from last class where the electric field due to a ring of charge, remember, is, uh, I'm going to rewrite it in terms of K. So remember k is 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught, uh, k z q over z squared plus r little i squared to the 3 halves. So let's double check this. So k is 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught, z in this case is the distance from the center of the disk, and r i is a distance from the center out to the outer radius. Remember the outer radius is capital R, so RR is like part of the way out. So if I if I look at this carefully, um, I need to also write down uh, what the charge distribution is. So if you remember, dQ is equal to the surface charge density times dA. In other words, the amount of charge in this little dA, which is the width of this ring. So if I imagine a ring that's a radius ri out and has a width dr or delta r, what's that area? Well, it'll be the charge density times that area. And for a small ring, I can replace that area with, uh, you know, I can approximate that area dA as 2 pi r dr. In other words, the length of the ring, which is the circumference, times the width. And for infinitesimal, that's a good approximation, or that's an, actually an exact approximation. So sigma times 2 pi ri dri. So I can use that now. So go back to this. I can say, you know, dE ring is equal to kz dq over all this stuff here, z squared plus ri to the 3 halves. So what I'm going to do is say, well, my electric field is going to be the integral over all those rings. I want to add up each little ring from r equals 0 to r equals capital R. So it's going to be integral from 0 to capital R of kz. And then for dq, I'm going to put in um, what we have here. Right? So for dq, I'm going to put in sigma 2 pi ri dri and that's over z squared plus ri squared to the 3 halves. Um, I can pull out a bunch of constants there, right? So pulling out a bunch of constants, most of this stuff is constants, so I can pull out k z sigma 2 pi and I end up with, oh, yeah, I got that, yes. And now I end up with ri over dri, like this, over z squared plus ri squared 
to the 3 halves, and that's between 0 and r. And you'll notice that that integral, let me keep all this stuff here, kz 2 pi sigma, that ends up being, if I look at that integral, it ends up being ri squared plus z squared to the minus 1 half. Uh, you can double check that. If you take the derivative of that, you will get the result. And so if I plug in my endpoints here and simplify, I'm going to plug in my endpoints and simplify a little bit, I get here, um, I get that the electric field is equal to, and this is plugging in the endpoints, moving things around, factoring out some common factors here, 1 minus z over r squared plus z squared. So this here is the electric field due to a disk of charge. So we'll call it electric field disk. And that's sort of the derivation um, for a disk of charge. Here's the result again, right? For a disk of charge, uh, the electric field is, uh, is nice and not simple. But if I look at the case for a large disk, so for a large disk, uh, where I say that basically R is much, much greater than Z. So if the disk gets really, really, really large, I can approximate this. Basically, if the disk gets really, really large, this basically goes to zero if R is really, 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 really big. So what's nice about that is then the electric field simplifies to something beautiful, just sigma over 2 epsilon naught. What does that mean? If I have an infinitely large sheet of charge, or if I have, if I'm really close to a sheet of charge, the electric field depends only on this here, the surface charge density. So that's how much charge there is per unit area, divided by a constant, right? Two and the permittivity of free space. So the electric field in this case is something very, very simple, um, which is really, really nice. It it predicts actually that the electric field everywhere throughout all space is constant. In other words, it doesn't change as you get further away from the sheet, which you would need an infinite sheet of charge for that to be true, but it's a really good tool for calculating electric fields close to a sheet of charge. If I'm close to the sheet, it's essentially constant. In reality, it's not, but close to it, it's an excellent approximation. And we're gonna, you know, we're gonna see situations where we can use that. So once again, here is the equation, right? For a very large sheet of surface, uh, sheet of charge, a large surface with uniform charge density sigma, it's just sigma over two epsilon naught. So if I, this is like a side view of a sheet of charge. So this sheet of charge is perpendicular to the page. On the right side, the electric field here is the same as the electric field here is the same as the electric field out here. It's all the same magnitude. On one side, it's pointing to the right, and the other side, it's pointing to the left. And if I had it for a negative charge they would all be pointing inwards and the magnitude would be the constant everywhere. So uh, a nice simple example, you know, let's just, let's just do one example of this. So if I have here uh, one sheet that is positively charged like so, and I have a sheet that is negatively charged over here, then here is the electric field here would be created by two things. So let's look at the electric field here. What would be the electric field due to the positive charge? Well, that's a positive sheet, so the electric field here would be pointing to the right, because it's going to be pointing away from the positive charge. And that would be equal to sigma over 2 epsilon naught. And the electric field due to the negative charge, because it's negative, it'll point towards it, right? So the electric field due to the negative charge would be pointing in the same direction. It would also be the magnitude would be sigma over two epsilon naught. So the total electric field here will be, the total electric field will be sigma over two epsilon naught plus sigma over two epsilon naught. So it'll just be sigma over epsilon naught. It's just two times that. And the electric field at any point between the two sheets is gonna be the same everywhere. It'll always be sigma over epsilon naught. Whereas if I look outside the sheet here, what's the electric field due to the positive one? It's that way, and that one is sigma over two epsilon naught because it's away from the positive sheet. And the electric field due to the negative one is gonna to be towards the negative sheet. And it's gonna be sigma over two epsilon naught. And that's gonna 
make an electric field of zero. So that will be the case everywhere in our ideal situation. The electric field everywhere outside the sheets is going to be zero. And inside, it's going to be uniform, which is a very, very useful situation. So summarizing, if I have here one positively charged sheet and one negatively charged sheet like this in our ideal situation, the electric field between them, I'm going to draw these electric field lines. We'll talk about more about what they mean as electric field lines is going to be uniform. So the electric field everywhere between them is going to be sigma over epsilon naught and the electric field outside everywhere is going to be zero. So we have uniform electric field inside and zero electric field outside. So in this example here, which direction is the electric field at point P near these large sheets of charge? Pause for a second and think about it. And it'll be to the right. Uh, if you look, the electric field to the positive will be to the right. The electric field to the negative will be to the right. So the total electric field will be to the right. Well, here, what's the electric field at this point between these two charges? Pause it and think about it. And it will be none of the above because the electric field due to the left side will be this way. The electric field due to the right side will be that way. So they're actually going to cancel each other out. So the net electric field will be will be zero. So these are sort of four different electric field calculations that we did using a continuous charge distribution, which is kind of handy. Uh, we will be using these on and off for a variety of purposes in the future. Here's a summary again, right? The electric field is zero outside. And for the, this is what a capacitor basically is, right? It's these two equal and opposite charged plates. Um, they, between them, if they're equal and opposite, their electric fields are going to reinforce each other. And outside, they're going to cancel each other. And so uh, that's the basic sort of setup for a capacitor. And as a reminder, the force on a charge inside this electric field is going to be Q times E. And what's nice about this is if the electric field is uniform, it's a constant electric field. That means the force is constant, and it makes it easier to solve problems. Okay? So uh, one example here that I wanted to look at is an electron enters an electric field. Okay? It has a speed of 5 times 10 to the 6 meters per second, and the electric field is 1 times 10 to the 3 newtons per coulomb. Okay, so the electric field is constant. Let me make a note of that. It is constant electric field. So how far? So what's going to happen to this electron as it goes in there? Well, as it enters, it's going to feel a force. So this electron here, remember, it feels a force to the electric field. And because the electric field is pointing to the right, the force on this electron will be in the opposite direction. So the electric field is going to be slowing it down. So let's write down everything we know so we can solve this problem. So V naught is the initial speed, 5.00 times 10 to the 6 meters per second. The electric field, the magnitude of the electric field is given as 1.00 times 10 to the 3 newtons per coulomb. The mass of the electron, it's on the equation sheet, but I'll give it to you, 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. Um, the charge of the electron, the charge of the electron is equal to minus E, which is minus 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. And we're saying how far will it go before it stops? So that means V final is zero, right? So what we need, you know, if we want to know how far it's go before it stops, we need to find the acceleration. So to find the acceleration, Right? I want the acceleration. That's going to be equal to force divided by mass. And force due to an electric field is just Q times the electric field. Okay? So uh, I can plug in everything into here, right? Uh, Q is minus 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19. E is 1 times 10 to the 3. The mass is 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31. And we end up with the acceleration is minus 1.756 times 10 to the 14 meters per second squared. So 
So that's a that's a crazy acceleration. All right. So how long will it take? You know, for it to stop here. So you know, if I have the acceleration, I uh, so now I want to use something to find how far it will go. So I'm going to use uh, x minus x naught is equal. Do you remember this? V naught t plus one half a t squared. There's a few ways you can do this. This is one of them. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, well, x naught is zero. And so we're just going to say that x is equal to v naught t plus one half a t squared. We need to know how long before it stops. Well, if it's accelerating at a constant rate, so we need t, right? So we need the time, how long to stop. So one way to do it is to say, well, the acceleration for a constant acceleration is delta v over delta t. So I can say that delta t is equal to uh, delta v over the acceleration. And so if I plug in delta v, you know, it, it, it goes from v times, it goes basically v final is 0 minus v initial, which is 5 times 10 to the 6 meters per second. And then divide it by the acceleration, which we just calculated, minus 1.7. 5, 6 times 10 to the 14 meters per second squared. And you see that I have meters per second divided by meters per second squared. So that's going to give me units of seconds, which is consistent. And my final answer for the amount of time is about 2.28.5 times 10 to the minus 9 seconds, or 28.5 nanoseconds. So now I have my delta t. So I can plug it into here. Plug, oops, plug in a time of 28.5 times 10 to the minus uh, 9 seconds. When I plug it in, I get that the total, dis you know, it's, I have to plug in V naught, which starts at 5 times 10 to the 6. I plug in the T, I plug in the acceleration. Remember the acceleration is negative. Uh, and when I plug in everything here, I get 0 0.0711 meters or about 7.11 centimeters. Okay, and so that's just an example of uh, a charged particle moving inside a uniform electric field. Um, this is another example here of a two-dimensional version of this. So here this electron is moving as shown between these two plates. In unit vector notation, what are the electron's acceleration and its velocity? when its uh, position has changed by two centimeters. So let's at least set up part of this. I'd like to talk about this. So, um, well, to find the acceleration vector, right, it's gonna be equal to the force vector divided by the mass. And the key here, the key to remember is that the force vector is only in the x direction. There is no, if that's my x direction and that's my y direction, so the force vector is only pointing in the x direction. So the force vector is just going to be Q times the electric field I hat. Okay. Uh, and let's write down, uh, I'm not going to do the whole problem here, but I just wanted to set it up. Q, remember it's an electron again, so it's minus E. The electric field is given. It is given as 120 newtons per coulomb. And the initial in the x direction is given, uh, where is it, there it is, 1.50 times 10 to the 5 meters per second. The initial in the y direction is given as 3.00 times 10 to the 3 meters per second. And so the acceleration is only in the x component. That means the y component of the velocity is constant. Okay, and so uh, this is sort of the setup for this, and I'll leave this for you to work out in more detail um, at a later date. Uh, I want to leave this one here for you too as well. A proton enters an electric field as shown. What does its path look like? Uh, let's Actually, we, we can do this one. If the proton enters this right here, it's traveling to the right, and as it enters, it's entering an electric field pointing downwards. And remember, this electric field is uniform. It's pointing downwards, so the electric field exerts a force on a positive particle in the direction of the electric field. So the path of this thing will be something sort of parabolic like this. This is kind of like gravity, right? 
And so here, the electric field is going to be exerting a force downwards. So if I want to calculate the acceleration vector, it will be the force vector divided by the mass. And the force vector is just QE. And in this case, we see that the electric field is pointing downwards. So I'm going to make this negative QE uh, like this. So that's and then divided by the mass. So you plug in there and that's your acceleration. I can plug in everything just to figure it out. So the charge of a proton is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. The uh, electric uh, field is 1.00 times 10 to the 3 newtons per coulomb i hat. And then the mass of this thing is it's a proton, so it's 1.67 times 10 to the minus. 27 kilograms and if you look at this uh, the coulombs cancel out and you're dividing out the kilograms from the newtons and that leaves meters per second squared which is consistent with uh, meter, uh, you know an acceleration so if I already calculate this 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 times here real quick 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 times 1 times 10 to the 3 divided by 1.67 times 10 to the 27, I get an acceleration of, oh, it's 10 to the minus 27. That's a much, much different calculation. I get about 9.58 times 10 to the, there's 10 to the 10 meters per second squared. So that's a crazy large acceleration.